looks like he's coming our way. Hopefully we can scare him away. Hey, not that one. Oh, baby. Adventure puppy. <clears throat> not sure if I'm gonna bring her along with me on this trip or not. By the time you guys are watching this, where am I gonna be? I should be getting nearing um, the coastal mountains of British Columbia. I'm gonna retrieve some trail cameras. And I'm going to take a, hopefully it's getting really cold, which is really good because where I want to hike to, there's possibly anywhere from, I don't know, four to six, seven feet of snow, but it's straight up the mountain. <clears throat> and what these deer do is they, uh, they don't give a shit about snow. It doesn't do anything to them. As long as they got mountains, they're fine and big mature timber because all the food knocks off the branches of the trees all winter long. It's scattered everywhere. So they just go uh, from shelf to shelf to shelf and they have trails all over the place and are connecting. And you can see where their beds are. In other words, their, their beds are usually at the bottom of the big first growth mature fir trees. So I already know where I'm going. It's just um, if it's really, really cold, then it'll be good because it'll be a big crust on top of that snow and I'll be able to hike up there with my boots on. And uh, I have used snowshoes to get up there, but I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with snowshoes. When you're hiking straight up a mountain on snowshoes, it really sucks. <laughs> it's difficult, right? But I'm going to go give it a go. It's going to be really cold. That's where I should be by the time you guys are watching this. And I'm going to videotape the hike in and the hike out just for the hell of it. That's where that I know. It might sound a little goofy to some people, but there is one. It's 110% that shed deer antler was placed on that trail after I walked past it. And in I think 18 years, I've never had one human being on any of my trail cameras on this mountain, ever. I managed to keep it a uh, secret from anyone, from, from all my regular, all the local people who lived around me, hunter hunters, I've kept it absolutely secret, this spot. Never shared it with anyone ever. It's a very special place. And um, there's some very special monstrous old bucks one that I've been after and followed for like five or six years, and I think he's back, and I can't wait to go check that camera. And what I do is I hike up into those cliffs and bluffs looking for their shed dropped antlers. And I think it's late enough now, they should be all be on the ground. And if they are, they should be exposed and on top of the snow, I hope. But that's where I'm going. And the antler that was dropped on the trail it wasn't fresh. Like some people might think, oh, the deer probably just dropped off his head. Nope, that antler was at least a year old. Had been shed off of the deer's head all over a year. That sucker was from the buck I was looking for, the antler I was looking for, and it was placed on that trail for me to find or see on the way back out. There's no way it wasn't. Anyway, there's my, there's my babble. Let's see what's going on this morning. The inbox is getting annihilated. Choked up uh, the Teespring site. I have pulled um, an executive decision. And I am deleting that Teespring from my from Sarah's life. Out, done, garbage, dog shit. Teespring can suck it. And that's me being nice about it. And um, I'm hoping she doesn't want to tackle everything on her own because that would just be ridiculous. We'll see what's going to come, how to correct that and deliver quality items to everyone from her without going through that dog shit garbage rip off piece of crap site. Response to helicopter spots tracks on the glacier. Okay, remember that? Somebody wrote in, I remember that. Somebody wrote in saying they knew someone who spotted tracks disappearing up on a glacier, they landed and took pictures, and I said, get a hold of that guy. We want to hear from him. Here's the response. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. You read my comment a second time about the Washington State Forester spotting a disappearing trackway from a helicopter, excuse me, and you said you'd like to hear from him if possible. He knew a lot about the forest people back 
went and made no big secret about it. I've spoken to him since those long gone days, but he sure wasn't shy about talking about the wild ones. Since you brought that incident up a second time, I searched and found my old address book with his landline number. I'll just give you his name and number. It was a long time ago that I worked with him, summer 95. No need for me to get in the middle, muddying the water. Either he'll talk to you or he won't. I can't think of a reason why he wouldn't. He's got some zingers and so have I. He gave me some important puzzle pieces a long time ago. I've got a huge ass puzzle, but the more pieces I get plugged in, the harder it is to find the right pieces in a pile of a thousand puzzles all dumped out on the floor. I'm Ron O in the comments. I prefer my name be kept anonymous to protect the innocent from my distorted version of reality. I'm a 61 year old forester and logging equipment operator. I've lived and worked in many remote areas of the Pacific Northwest, Southeast and South Central Alaska. Bunk houses, travel trailers and endless motel rooms from Denali to Mount Shasta. I've probably flown a hundred different DH beavers and otters over the years. Flew with Treadwell once. Andrews Air Kodiak dropped me off on Afghanak Island and took him over to his camp on the Alaska Peninsula. I heard the first hand, I heard first hand the Teddy Grand Finale from the pilot who found old Teddy and his girlfriend ate up. Willie dive bombed the bears with the beaver and ran them off the bodies. Old Willie hung it up after that. He'd flown the bush up there a long time. Last I heard he was roaming the world in a sailboat. Adventure. I know, you know what I'm talking about. It's a lifestyle, not just a vacation. It's actually, apparently it's in our DNA too. I was talking to, I mentioned earlier, I spoke to, I met and spoke with a guy for a while named Guy Shockey. You can Google him up. Fighter pilot, adventure maniac, and he uh, told me, I can't, I have to look back in the conversation and Google up what he's actually talking to me about, meaning Googling up the, uh, the DNA part, but he said there's a proven fact that people messed up like us have it's in our DNA to have that what's over the hill in us. Kind of odd mention, right? Sorry about that. And uh, yeah, I know some people that know that pilot as well. And heard the same myself. It's a small uh, it's a small world when you get into the adventure crew, right? And everybody's everybody's inter intertwined somehow or another. I shared a house for 30 plus years with an uncle slash BFF who left on the long journey in 2015. Sharing the house allowed me to travel and adventure for work. We lived in a small town close to Mount Rainier from 84 to 2015. In 2016, I moved down to Oregon's Willamette Valley to help care for, elder, for elderly family. I didn't know I was going to end up writing an actual book, a real book, but that's what it seems to be happening. Me and my uncle were both avid readers and history buffs. We debated and argued about everything, endlessly. When he passed, I donated his 400 book collection on the Civil War to the University of Washington. His hero generals that won the war and freed the slaves enslaved my hero's people, Sitting Bull, Chief Joseph, and Geronimo. We argued a lot and both learned. I'll start to reply in comments to something that triggered me. I'll I'll save it to notes and research and really flush out what I'm thinking and slash or no. The internet has allowed me to find obscure stuff I'd read years ago or to hear and see people speak i had been reading about for years, like Clayton Mack. Yeah, we got people uh, directly linked to Clayton Mack and his family too, and some of his family have emailed me directly. Clayton Mack is a... Uh, a uh, native guide from British Columbia on the coast. Bella Coola is one of his home bases, I believe, and he wrote a book, Grizzlies and White Guys, and it has a few of his first-hand Sasquatch encounters in there, and some of his hunters were with him too, believe, I believe, at the time. I've got a lot to share. Natural history, indigenous philosophy, knowledge, spirituality, and prophecies. I've written up most of my on-the-job encounters, and I'm still working on many more strange encounters slash woo-woo experiences. So, well, I've got your attention. 
A very close friend of 40 years who passed on in 2020, in the 1990s was a Woods Cop Natural Resources Investigator for Washington State DNR. He was part Choctaw and grew up on the North California coast and was given the name Two Bears by a friend's Pomo grandmother because he ate like two bears when he was a kid. <laughs> That's a good one. Two bears really did know a lot about a lot about stuff that goes bump in the night. He was a big brother and spiritual gatekeeper as they dug deep into the realms of the unseen on my spiritual journey. Seems he was always years ahead of me on the trail. He's way up ahead of me now. I don't remember him ever getting called to investigate a Bigfoot disturbance, but if he did, he was a knower since he was a kid. If you had to have LEO involved in that kind of problem, he'd been the guy. We'd have been out in the bushes beating his drum. He'd have been out in the bushes beating his drum, burning sweet grass and smoking his pipe, trying to schedule a sit down. Get this shit ironed out. Miss you, my brother. Two Bears was doing a timber theft investigation west of Darrington, Washington, using a spotting scope and a camera with a long lens, giant lens. Back in the day, back in the film days, sorry, back in the film days, he was up on a high landing, surveilling a logging road and gate a mile down and across the Stillquamish Road, River, and Highway 530 at O Dark 30. At daybreak, a guy popped out of the brush and walked down Highway 530 a quarter mile and disappeared back in the timber. Mincio Dancive. Dancive. Mincio Dancive. The White Horse Mountain Hermit, who was responsible for 70 plus burglaries along the North Fork Stillquamish River between Oso and Darrington over a 10 year span. When two bears got eyeballs on him and a good photos, it was obvious Mincio was living feral. He was dressed in filthy rags and packing a spear. The Snohomish Sheriff's Office had handled all the break-ins over the years and wanted him, just didn't know who he was or where to look. It broke the case. Two bears had found the guy's area of travel. Mincio said later, he avoided using the same trails and making paths. The Sheriff's Office said to track her up who rigged the area with sensors and cameras and had Snohomish County SWAT on call. Mincio triggered a sensor and SWAT dropped in on him with a helicopter. A short chase ensued and the police dog got to him first. He stuck Fido in the shoulder with a wire pronged fish spear and a pissed off Rin Tin Tin did a number on him. The dog bit off the heel of one of his feet. Ooh, that would hurt. The cops had a hell of a time getting Spot unclamped off the guy's thigh. For 12 years, Mincio Donciev had been living in holes in the ground, up on White Horse Mountain at Timberline, coming down to raid the vacation cabins along the river for supplies. Two Bears said the rumor among the cops was that he escaped a communist prison and knifed a guard to escape through the old Iron Curtain. He'd somehow made it to Seattle in the early 80s without a passport. He got in trouble with a girlfriend and her Seattle cop brother. Two Bears said Seattle PD had him on arson. He tried to burn the girlfriend's house. Someone with phony ID paid a cash bail to spring him in 84-85. Nobody saw this guy again for years. He was leaving threatening notes and trashing cabins the last couple of years, warning people not to mess with him or try to corner him. <laughs> Google has, Google has several newspaper articles under White Horse Mountain Hermit. The case made the five o'clock news a couple of times. The crazy shit was the dog that bit him had been deemed too vicious for Tacoma canine work and had been given to Snohomish SWAT as an attack dog. Mincio Donceve spent a year in county jail and, and sued Snohomish County over the dog. He won a $400,000 settlement and split back home to Bulgaria. He said he always slept in the day because the, quote, dangerous, end quote, animals were active at night. I'm still amazed that Mincio survived alone for so long. What did he know about the forest people? 
I didn't think till a few years later about the possibility of interviewing him and writing a book about him. Mincio is not the only human being that's chose to immerse in a cryptic wilderness lifestyle. There is an endless, endless Cladstein immoral criminal element of dope growers, smugglers, poachers, cedar rats, etc., etc., out in them hills. They are probably responsible for a lot of missing, along with the usual creepy, weird serial killers. Mincio was packing two pistols, several knives, and a pronged spear. I think an encounter with a guy like Mincio has way more potential of a lethal outcome than a run-in with a wild one. The forest people certainly understand about shoot, shovel, and shut up. They see and deal with the dregs of humanity. When just being seen is a real danger for a man or a beast, a trophy poaching clan out of Longview, Washington, finally got busted three or four years ago. Scumbags slaughtered trophy wildlife in Washington and Oregon for years. What happens to some poor hiker who blunders on them, hacking the head off of a trophy in a national park? These are just an they, these are the animals out there that scare me. Just because it goes bump in the night doesn't make it an encounter with the forest people. I used to tease two bears about how Big Brother is always out there watching. <clears throat> Excuse me. The wind just kind of blew me this way. In the summer 2003. From a house outside of Black Diamond, Washington, I went down to the Detroit Lake Mount Jefferson area of Oregon of the Oregon Cascades for a working job interview running logging equipment. After work the first night, I went 10 miles to a store in Detroit and back out to the job site and up the log and road past the job to find a place to crash out. It was a beautiful full moon, hot summer night, high in the mountains, and the land glowed in the moonlight and shadows. I didn't have to be at work until later in the morning. I turned up a spur road that looked like it was going up. I wanted to find me a room with a good view. The road followed a ridge top up through a patch of big timber. I felt an intense presence, a jolt like escaping a car crash. I felt them. I just knew. I was a little apprehensive, but I wasn't really scared. And this wasn't my first rodeo. I can still see it in my mind's eye as I crawled past on the road, a large shadow like a big stump in a clump of trees, a couple hundred feet down off the road below my driver's side and my senses being riveted to that stump and bunch of trees. About a half mile further up, I got to the ridge top landing and the five-year-old regen slash clear cut. That's, uh, that, he means the timber was planted five years ago. It's five-year-old trees in the uh, log up area. Awesome view of Mount Jefferson and the North Santium Canyon. After 10 p.m. it was still over 80 degrees. There was a big grassy flat I parked on and I laid out my sleeping mat, pillow, and Pendleton blankets on the ground behind my truck. I had my rawhide drum, a bone whistle, and a big abalone shell filled with sage, sweet grass, and tobacco. The smoke acts like a spiritual cleanser guardian and a messenger that carries prayers to the grand reality beyond. I blew my whistle and fanned the smudge smoke with a feather as I stood and beseeched each cardinal direction, west, north, east, south, earth, sky. The six grandfathers, the human being, stands at the center of the circle and connects those powers. Lakota holy men. Black Elk's short prayer explains it far better than I can. Quote, Peace comes within the souls of men when they realize their relationship, their oneness with the universe and all its powers. When they realize that at the center of the universe dwells Wonka Tonka and that this center is really everywhere it is within each of us." End quote. quote, Dominant society must come to recognize that we're all human beings, recognize our connection to the reality of power is in that identity, human, our Bone, flesh, and blood, or DNA, is literally made up of the metals, minerals, and liquids of the earth. We are parts of the earth, shapes of the earth, like everything of the earth. We have being, our being, our spirit, and that being comes from our relationship to the sun, the sky, and the universe. John Trudell. The Medicine Wheel teachings are fundamental to my understanding of spirituality, the circle of life, and my relationship to the universe. 
Smells and sounds travel between worlds, and speaking from the heart, prayer mode changes the harmonic vibrations we project. The drum and rattle are vibrational tools that help immerse oneself in the meditative, meditative experience and connects to the language of the heart, the language of the universe. There's an old Zen koan. Quote, It is only with heart that one can see rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye, end quote. Quote, tears come from the heart and not from the brain, Leonardo da Vinci, end quote. Like my daddy said, it is in your heart, not your head, Ozark Mountain Daredevils. Prayer is asking the question, speaking from the heart. Meditation is listening for the answers, listening with the heart. The medicine wheel teachings underpin a spiritual reality mostly missing in dominant society and the language of the heart. Countless encounter stories go from emotional turmoil to instant serenity when the language of the heart is engaged. If the forest people do see in infrared spectrums, maybe they can see and or sense our hyper excited emotional state of pulsating, a pulsating red aura, which it watch it turn into an aura of tranquil golden light. How often have we heard, it really wasn't mind speak, or I didn't hear voices, I just had a feeling. I'd call that heart speak. In the same vein as announcing our presence or intentions when entering the wild. The forest people must have hearts the size of pumpkins, as their hearts are their hearts just giant emotional pumps that receive and transmit harmonic vibrations? Do their eyes change color with their emotions? I've certainly heard people describe being pissed off as seeing red. After I blew my whistle the last time, a high-pitched trill, just like my whistle, only way louder and longer than mine, floated up to me and the area down the hill where I had that strange feeling. Just that one long, loud whistle. I sat, I sat cross-legged on my mat with my blanket around me and beat out a soft chant and rhythm till I went to sleep around midnight. I woke in the morning. I woke with the morning stars at first light and made coffee with a hiking stove on my truck's tailgate. I laid out my medicine things on a blanket and drummed, sang and smudged as the sun came up and lit the mountain in pink and purple hues. I had birds surrounding me singing a new day. Kumbaya. Before I bundled my stuff, I took some pictures up the mountain and things laid out on my old blanket. When I developed the pictures, the pics with my things were blacked, were blacked out with white specks, and all the other pictures were fine. I went down to the job around 9 a.m. and spent the day messing stuff up and pissing off the logger. I was green, and the job was complicated, and the machine had problems. The number one problem for me was an enclosed sealed cab. The windows didn't open and the air conditioner was kaput on a hundred degree day. I was, I was heat stressing bad. No thanks. I took off that afternoon and stopped at an aunt and uncle's farm between Salem and Portland to spend the night and then drive home to Washington in the morning. <laughs> Good call. That sounds like frickin' hell. My aunt told me this story that night, that very night. She and I were sitting on our deck in the dark on her deck in the dark, having a long heart-to-heart -heart talk. I was pretty drained and talkative. We've been talking about medicine men, holy people, and red road spirituality. At one point, Auntie L asked me where I'd spent the night before, and I told her about how beautiful it was the night before and that morning. For some reason, I told her I thought I had contact with a wild one. And she blurted out excitedly, Oh my God, you believe in them? She made me promise I wouldn't tell. Several of her sisters, including my mom, are pretty enthusiastic about their fundamentalist beliefs and the Earth people ain't included in those beliefs. Auntie Al passed away in 2008 and I've told one of her sisters and one of her sons. My mom and two of their sisters, I ain't telling. It amounts to beating your head on a rock trying to convince them of anything that goes against the approved narrative. Tell me all about it. You just end up with a massive headache, and the rock don't feel nothing. I'm sure she'd approve of this. I felt her absolute relief in telling me what she had experienced. She said she was horrified of people thinking she was batshit crazy. Yeah, what a shitty thing, isn't it? Isn't it brutal? 
so many innocent people and a pile of them right here. And all you're doing is being honest and sharing with somebody who you trust. Hey man, guess what I've seen? Oh, you're a psychopath, right? So many window lickers in, the, in society today. Well, but my lip. NTL kept her secret for 12 or 13 years. I don't remember exactly, but it was the summer of 90 or 91 when it happened. She was in her mid-50s, recently divorced, mom of five grown children and a geriatric nurse in Salem, Oregon. It was a baking hot Williamette Valley afterno afternoon and she had the day off. She and her little poodle mix went east of Highway 22 between Detroit Lake and Santium Junction at the Oregon Cascades. She had a spot she liked along the upper north Santiam River. It's a public day use area where she felt safe with other people around. I remember her saying that. The water level is real low and the water braided through channels among the river rock. She was sitting on a rock toward the center of the 100 foot wide stream bed. Sandals off, soaking her feet and her dog went nuts, growling at something upstream. What Auntie L saw was seven to eight feet tall, covered in long, graying, reddish-brown hair, dark brown skin, and dark eyes. Auntie giggled when she told me she saw an old woman's soggy boobies. <laughs> Grandma Squatch was standing in the water in her knees upstream of my aunt, 75 to 100 feet. Auntie said, about the same time the smell hit her, Auntie said she has smelled worse at work, but it was a definite elderly feminine hygiene issue. <laughs> Nana was wearing an apron that covered her from midways to her mid thigh. I asked if it wrapped all the way around and aunt said she didn't know. I asked my aunt if it was woven like basket basketry and she immediately went, yeah, that's it. Could have been cedar bark, cattails, bear grass, etc. Grandma was balancing a five or six foot long cone basket, cone basket made of sticks with a 21 foot wide mouth at the large end. Let me read that one more time. Grandma was balancing a five or six foot long cone basket made of sticks with a two foot wide mouth at the large end on her left shoulder with her arm and hand. My auntie hadn't realized what it was. She thought it was a basket. She told me and bingo. Fish weir. The old girl was fishing the pools on the shallow river. Monkeys don't use tools like that. The right arm hung at her side and her hand was down to the water by her knee. Aunt said they locked eyes at the same time. Nana raised her right arm and motioned toward the parking area a few hundred feet away. Go. Auntie L said she felt an understanding had passed between them about being mothers and healers. Nana turned towards the opposite bank and calmly started wading toward the timber. Auntie had grabbed her dog right away, so she already had her. She grabbed her stuff and headed toward her car and didn't look back. She said she hauled ass back home to the valley. She didn't realize till she was halfway home that she was still barefoot. So a couple days later on the news, Auntie L saw that a woman was raped and stabbed to death at what my aunt was convinced was the same rest area. Auntie Al was carrying guilt because she had been afraid to call the cops and or even tell anyone what she'd seen. 13 years later, she was still worried and feeling guilty about not reporting it. She was worried about them finding her flip-flops and tracking her down. She'd met two bears a couple years before and was okay with me running it past him. She was really pleased with the idea. She realized she wasn't alone. I helped put her mind at ease. I called two bears after I got home. His immediate response was that Grandma Sasquatch was not a murdering rapist and wouldn't use a knife anyway. He also pointed out that Auntie wasn't in any way harmed or even threatened. Nana might have sensed danger lurking around and ran her off, was her response. He always thought that if your head and heart was in the right place, seeing them was a blessing. Be careful out there, folks. We're all in this, we are all in this together, like it or not, Ron O. There you go, Ron O. I could probably sit there and, uh, I could probably sit and listen to you talk for about a week straight without saying shit, just taking it all in. You've seen a lot, my friend. You've seen a lot, you know a lot. You're a wise man, a free man, and I can guarantee you, 
you see through all of the thick bullshit that's wrapped around our society here today, right? I don't think I, I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could phone a stranger after receiving their phone number from the internet and without them having any kind of a heads up. That would be awkward for me, because I I get uh, strange numbers phone my phone all the time and I don't answer one of them ever. It's weird, I had a Florida number phone, try to phone me the other day, it's all sorts of weird numbers. I always find two it seems after you fly by a, by a plane ticket. Not long afterwards, your, uh, your weird phone numbers start showing up from all over North America. It's a bit of a pain in the ass. But you know they're selling your information, right? Phone numbers and emails, it's big money once you get a whole bunch of them. Aren't you glad I haven't sold your guys' emails? <laughs> anyway, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you a lot if you're taking that time to, to send us all of that. And please, if you could, and if you feel like it, send me more. Send me more when you got a chance, all right? I want to hear it all. I want to hear what you got. I want to hear the knowledge. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. That was an interesting read. Absolutely appreciate you, man. Next one's titled Strange Encounter and Footprint. And it looks to be two emails here. Which one's first? Um, December 21st, 2020. Wow. All right, let's start off the first. We'll just read it all. Here we go. It's freezing in here, man. Strange encounter and footprint. Hi, Steve. I've been watching your channel for quite some time now. Love the stories that you share. So I finally decided to share my experience. It was about three years ago. I was deer hunting in the mountains of Ash County, North Carolina. I went in the woods early that morning. Around 5 a.m., I was climbing up the tree with my climbing stand when all of a sudden something made this loud whooping sound from behind me. It did this twice, and then the woods began and then the woods became completely silent. Needless to say, I froze in my tracks and all I could think about was that I was only 10 to 15 feet off the ground, excuse me, and I didn't know what the heck had just made this noise. So I had my flashlight in my hand and I slowly turned around, turned on the light and there was nothing there, no sound of anything running or walking away. I quickly finished climbing up the tree to about 35 feet off the ground or I sat waiting and listening until daylight, but there, was, but there was only complete silence. I wrote it off as being a bear at first, but there was something inside me that told me it wasn't a bear. I stopped hunting that spot because I started having a feeling of being watched every time I went there. Then this year I decided to go back and do some scouting before season. I found a footprint in the mud. It was about 15 or 16 inches long that looked like a barefoot human track. It sent chills up my back and decided to not go back there again. You can use my name if you like. I've discussed this with some of my friends and was surprised to find out that some of them have had similar experiences, but were afraid to tell anyone. Thanks for the support, John Church. Right on, John. Make sure you send this if you can and you have contact with friends. Send them this video. All right, and they'll know that there is tens of thousands of other people in this club, hundreds of thousands. Here's your next email. This has become a family thing. Hi, Steve. I wrote to you a couple of years ago about an experience I had while hunting in Ash County, North Carolina. Since then, I have started hunting with my son, daughter-in-law, and grandson in Rockingham County, North Carolina. In 2011, I got to be in the stand with my grandson when he got his first deer. Oh my God, that would have been wicked. We thought that he would be on fire, wanting to hunt all the time, but that was about to change. The very next weekend, he saw something standing behind him in the woods watching him. He described it as very big and dark colored, at least eight to nine feet tall. He said that after he looked at it, that it turned and walked across the hill away from him. Then my daughter-in-law saw what she thought was a very large man that afternoon. She said that he was carrying a deer on his shoulder. And when he reached the creek, he threw the deer about 50 feet across the creek and disappeared. Then a couple days later, my son and grandson, grandson were back there hunting. 
And my grandson saw the same thing he had saw that weekend walk across the field about 50 yards from him. Needless to say, he won't go back in the woods without someone with him. I'm surprised he'd go at all. After that, being a boy. Now, for my son who's experiences that same season, sorry, now for my son and his experiences that same season, he heard tree knocks. Later, I was hunting the same stand one morning when all of a sudden all the squirrels disappeared and the woods went completely silent. Then I hear the tree knocks myself. I remembered what you said. So I said out loud, I know you're here. I know you know that I'm here. I don't want to bother you and I don't want you to bother me. After that, everything went back to normal. Which gets me to this past season and my son's latest experience. He asked me if I had anything strange Oh, sorry. He asked me if I had heard anything strange while hunting one of our stands. Then he, then he started telling me that he had heard something that sounded like a monkey while hunting there. So, when I ran across the sounds of the Sierra recording, I sent it to him. After listening to it, he said that was exactly what he had heard. Now, we are a family in the club of no return. I'm wondering now if you have ever heard of this happening to a family like this before. Thanks, Steve, for everything you do and all the stories you share, John Church. Man, I don't know, John. Um, we've had lots of people with family sightings. Lots of people have heard and seen something, and then their kids tell them they had something look in the window. So that basically makes the family combined experiences, right? Huh, that's a handful of, uh, I don't think it's that common to have a whole family report having such a frickin' dead-eye clear uh, sightings. I don't blame your boy for not wanting to go in the woods alone. Who would, right? Now I struggle sometimes. Even where I'm going, where I am going tomorrow and the next day, this, that, the place where I'm going is right across from where I showed you guys where I videotaped those bright lights way up in the mountain. And it was like minus 30. Minus 25, 4 or 35 in the morning. And then uh, I just, I'm going to right near where I was. I heard a big, long screech scream where I found footprints. Um, probably five miles from there is where a friend of mine was jogging down a road who doesn't really give this topic any energy. And something was paralleling him in the timber that would freak the shit out of him. What else? Another family... Another couple saw and photographed uh, footprints coming down the other side of the valley, the back side, in the direction of the hill where I'm going. Uh, oh, what am I getting at? What am I getting at is, um, yeah, I got apprehension. You still today, with all my experience, I still right right now. I right now and leading up to going into onto that mountain in that big timber, I wonder if anything's going to happen. But yeah, right now I have. Full, not full anxiety, but I've got some anxiety. I've got apprehension, right? Because I know they're there. I know they're all around there. When? I don't know. Are, is, it gonna, is it going to be the day that I have my next face-to-face? -face? I don't know. <laughs> you, do you know what I mean? I know it's going to happen. Is it going to happen in the next couple days? I don't know. It might. There's a good chance of it. Don't want it to happen? Not really. Not really into it, but if it happens and... Uh, if it happens that I can have some kind of a conversation, I think I'd be down with it. But anyway, I'm babbling about me. Um, yeah, I hope I hope your family members haven't been stripped of their enjoyment of the real world. That would be very unfortunate. That would really suck. And that makes me angry when I hear about that happening. But anyway, um, make sure you possibly, if they, they may want to hear this, send them this video, all of them, so that they can... Uh, watch and learn and bring some sort of comfort to them knowing that they're not alone and that, that they uh, are not crazy and this is happening to literally hundreds of thousands of people around the globe obviously there are bigger problems going on around the globe right now and uh i was actually sent dave an email this morning talking about it, mentioning it saying how uh, it's frustrating to uh, come across so much knowledge of the deception and the dog shit going on and all you can do is like the odd time drip feed it to all of you 
because for some weird reason the majority of people I don't want to hear about that and they shut down and also Google YouTube will uh, slam the channel shadow ban it which it has and then nobody can find this channel and it does not get suggested in their feed and people get unsubscribed from this channel because you're revealing truth right you're suggesting people look into truth and look away from the misleading it's very frustrating am i babbling how many coffees have i had <laughs> Ooh, that's frozen coffee already i don't know what the temperature is but it's damn cold anyway i gotta get going am i bringing the dog i don't think so why am i not bringing the dog because in this particular area if I can find the photograph, I'll show it to you. I hiked up the trail one time and I had a bunch of trail cameras and I was placing them and a pack of about nine wolves were following me. And I could kind of sense it in a way I felt something was up, but it didn't feel like that dread at all. It just felt like something's up. And I circled around back and boom, there that big lead gray one came out in a rock and was looking around on the trail that I was on looking up and then I looked at it and then it saw me looking at it. And then uh, it ducked back and there's still a bit of snow on the ground. I went and checked all the prints out. But where I'm going is wintering zone for deer. And uh, there's going to be cats and wolves in there as well. I don't know when. And with a goofy dog like her right now, I don't know if she will stick to my legs tight. And I can't really put her on a leash because it's going to be so difficult to climb on that, on that snowpack right now. Straight up and around rocks. And I don't need her going off down a trail after fresh deer scent or pushing up a deer running after it and if there is a couple of wolves around there they don't give a shit about me they will rip her guts out and shred her instantly and that'll be completely out of my control because I'll be stuck on the other side of the hill on a snowbank listening to it or whatever it's just it's just too high risk I think at this point right now for me to uh if there's no snow on the ground yeah I'd bring her I just put her on a leash and keep her tight to me, but it's just going to be too, too difficult on that, uh, those slippery slopes and climbing up the cliff, a couple of cliff shoots I got to climb up, across a frozen creek, steep, yeah, so I won't be bringing the dog. When there's no snow, I will. Will I be bringing a weapon? Hell, of course I will, <laughs> right? It's wintering zone for game. The predators are thick there. I know the chances of something happening are very, very slim one in a cabillion, but there's still a chance. And if I allow it to happen, it'd probably happen to me, right? So yeah, I'll be armed for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna get going. I am going to possibly, I'm gonna uh, sit on that rock where, they, where that antler was on the trail. I'm gonna sit right there. It's my plan anyway, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna make a video from there and share a bunch of voices from there. And then maybe I may, I'll, use, I'll use the GoPro because then I can edit on my phone and, and uh, load it up onto YouTube in the evening, possibly. So there you go. That's the plan. I'll be back shortly. Send all you got to sharemystoryhowtot.com.